fantastic. And a few years ago, there was a book called The Passover Plot that said that 16 of these characters fell asleep. They snored mightily, in unison, maybe in harmony, while a collection of itinerant fishermen, an ex-crooked tax collector, a 14-year-old boy, and maybe a few women, sneaked in by night, quietly. They rolled at least a ton and a half uphill, quietly. They stole the body of Jesus, and they got away with it. Well, anything is possible in this crazy old world of ours, but that's awfully high in my list of improbabilities. To make it better, the stone was sealed with Pilate's seal. That one was easy. A gob of wax or clay on each side of the stone. Two more vertically. Two leather floors. A gob of wax where they crossed. Pilate's ring. Applied in the presence of the legion. The penalty for breaking the seal of Rome without authorization? Crucifixion. Upside down. If they couldn't find you, they'd round up every man, woman, and child in a given village or town and crucify the whole place. That's why Hitler learned it. You simply did not break the seal of Rome without authorization. We did not intend to do all this, but I think that we have shown rather conclusively that never in the history of mankind has the body of a condemned criminal been as securely guarded as was Jesus of Nazareth. All Rome was going to make sure that he didn't come out of that hole. That's why nobody but one of them the pride of the Roman legion could possibly have told Matthew what he wrote. And nobody but Matt would have talked to a Roman to find out what he had to say. Yeah, it's like a drumhead. You see, they were there to guard a seal. If that seal got broken, 16 Romans died. They'd have killed anyone who came within 70 feet of it. That's what they were there for. Nobody in their right mind would go near the garden. Sure, the women came back in innocence on Sunday. They didn't know the soldiers were there. While they were home obeying their holiday laws, their own high priest was breaking them by going to Pilate and asking for a Roman god on the Sabbath. The only thing in context that makes any sense is the Romans must have gone over the hill before the women showed up. Because if it was a question of three or four women or 16 Romans, guess who just lost that fight? So nobody in the world but a Roman soldier could possibly have told Matthew that at some time between sundown on Saturday night and sunrise of the day that we call the first Easter, an angel descended. The appearance of the angel was like lightning. There was a severe earthquake. The stone was rolled away. The God became like dead men. Jesus came out. Now that's first century language. There's no theologian of any denomination who's going to try to tell you that the Holy Spirit gave the writers of the Bible a supernatural language in which to write, a language that every generation would understand. That is not true. Each man wrote in the language he himself spoke with a vocabulary at his own command. And that's one of the reasons we have so many different translations of the Bible. It has to be retranslated every generation, so that each generation has it in the language they themselves speak. I do not speak the same English my father did. Over half of you don't speak the same English I do. You're a different generation. And I know what I'm talking about. I've got a 25-year-old son. I swear we don't even communicate. Oh, we think alike. Dave travels around with an NIV under his arm most of the time. No matter where I go in the world, along about Wednesday or Thursday, he tracks me down. Always collect. Someday they'll learn to pay their own telephone bills. He said it's his job to make sure that I haven't become apostate and gone over the hill with a blonde. He's got to keep me straight. It's different when your son's checking on you. I like it. But we don't communicate. The simplest word that everybody in this congregation understands is the word gay. I grew up understanding that word to mean happy, joyful, ebullient, merry, Having a good time? Does somebody want to tell me it means that today? If that word were in the Bible, more than the one time it does appear in the KJV, in James, something about gay clothing, it's no problem. We'd have to retranslate every copy of the Bible there was to make it mean what the original language meant. What I'm saying is that if you really think about it, you know doggone well that the meanings of words change from one generation to another. In less than one generation, the meaning of that word has changed over 180. Matthew was a first century Jew. He was writing in first century Greek. Was he saying something that the people of his generation understood perfectly and we don't? Was he using words, I've made my point, the Greek's famous for it, that have more than one meaning? We had to find out. We took that story apart almost a syllable at a time, only looking for answers to our own questions. We found our key in the word earthquake, seismic, seismic seismology, seismograph. But the literal translation of that word then and today is a severe commotion. The only important thing being, where is the commotion happening? If it's in the ground, a seismic is an earthquake. If the commotion is in the air, then and today you would translate it wind, 
gale, tempest. Matthew used the word in the eighth chapter to describe the storm on the Sea of Galilee. When Jesus rebuked the seismus and the, winds were, the waves were still, he rebuked the wind. Aristotle taught that earthquakes were only severe gales blowing through subterranean caverns, making the ground rumble, rattle, and roll. To the first century Jew, I beg your pardon, to the first century Greek, it was only a question of where is the big wind blowing. The appearance of the angel, not his features, but his idea, his aspect, he looked like, he appeared to be, a brilliant white light, a flash, a glare, a burst of white light, something that's going to light up the entire sky, lightning. At which point the scream was, hallelujah, we got it. If you haven't noticed, I haven't told you what produced these images in back of me. And I can't. Up until October of 1981, I'd have said we know. But until 120 of the best names in the world, and I'm not one of them, could sign the paper and give it to the world for free, we're not talking. We did everything imaginable to avoid sensationalism, to keep anyone from making a buck out of it. It didn't work, but we tried. Today, I've got to say that after six years plus of the most intensive research that science is capable of bringing to bear on anything, we do not know what produced the image on the Shroud of Turin. When we had the symposium in October of 81 at Connecticut College in New London, UConn at Avery Point, they came from all over the world. Two teams from Australia, Nippon Television, all over Europe, all over this country. All but one team packed up and went back home when they found out that there were not going to be any sensational announcements. This is or is not Jesus. He was or was not resurrected. They were demanding sensationalism. I always felt that what they got was sensational enough. I couldn't believe it the first time I heard it. They were told, and they did very little with it, that the image on the Shroud of Turin is not a forgery. It was not made by human hands. How's that for a statement by modern science? It was not made by human hands. It is not possible for modern science to duplicate it. We know how to put a team on the moon, and we can do it again. We don't know how to reproduce this image. It appears to have been produced by something that resulted in the oxidation, dehydration, and the conjugation of the polysaccharide structure of the microfibers of the linen itself. Well, there might be five honest people in this room. The rest of you chemists already know that uh, that's nothing but scientists' double talk, unless you happen to be a chemist, for the fact that the image is a scorch. It's burned onto the topmost fibers of the cloth. But what produced that burn is beyond the capability of modern science to duplicate in the laboratory. And one of the unbreakable laws of science is that no matter what you're looking at, no matter what you believe you have in your hand, unless you can duplicate it in the lab, you're forced to say you don't understand it. You simply don't understand something you can't duplicate. How do you duplicate a one-shot? Something which doesn't seem to have happened before. It certainly hasn't happened since. This is very crude, but it's the best I can do. If you can imagine pulling one hair out of your head, scorch one face of that hair. Do not get the sides, definitely not the bottom. Scorch one face of one hair. You might be able to duplicate one aspect of the problem, but that can't be done. Again, this is crude. If you can imagine an infinite number of laser beams, this is not laser. It is non-isotropic. There's no diffusion. One for every single pore in the body, coming out in a straight line, vertical mapping, scorching an uncountable number of tiny dots, almost like a newspaper picture under magnification, only on the topmost fibers of the cloth. Again, you might be able to duplicate another aspect of the problem. But that type of energy doesn't exist on Earth. There's only some indication of it on a 14-foot-long piece of cloth in Italy. So what happens? It's back to the lab, maybe forever. We are planning to go back to Italy as quickly as possible, as soon as the church will let us have the cloth, if they will. Every question that was answered in 1978 has raised 10 new ones that no one could possibly have conceived of at that time. Every theory that anyone has ever come up with has been tried. Chemistry is 100% done on the cloth. It completely refutes physics. How do you tell someone in school that the laws of physics are no longer immutable? We have something that says they're wrong, and yet they're right. Chemistry, X-ray fluorescence, ultraviolet, infrared, totally preclude the possibility of paint having been used on this cloth. There is absolutely nothing on this cloth that could have been used to produce pigment in any form whatsoever, despite what you might have read in some of the mag newspapers. They overkilled the point. They had to refute a book which shouldn't have been written. They certainly overkilled it. It is not a painting.